and let me pull. <coughs> Right. Okay, so, so here we are. I'm very happy to uh, welcome Professor Sylvia Melo Pfeiffer. Sorry, there was an F too much in the in the announcement, but it will be corrected when we upload the talk in on the serial website. Uh, Sylvia is full professor of foreign languages, um, French and Spanish, foreign language teacher education at the University of Hamburg in Germany. So she did a very extra uh, effort because it's 11 p.m. in Germany at this moment. So thank you particularly for that. Um, Professor uh, Melo Pfeiffer's main research areas are on plurilingual education, pluralistic approaches to languages and cultures in language learning and teacher education, and the use of arts-based approaches in research. Uh, you have received also two interesting articles that uh, Professor Melo Pfeiffer suggested for um, preparing this course, uh, and um, we are we are very happy to welcome you uh, at least virtually to our research colloquium class. And thank you for accepting to be part of this uh, journey. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Enrica. Uh, thank you for listening uh, to me today. Thank you for the invitation, Enrica. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and to talk to, to your, to your um, I think they are master students, PhD students. Oh, well, this course is um, mandatory for PhD students and MA la students, la. Uh, but there are uh, <laughs> also a med students that are admitted to this course if they are interested mm -hmm. in taking it, and several are. And for the talk of the external, there are, I see several uh, students who already did this course maybe last year, because every year is a new um, a series of um, presenters and also other um, students, they can come also from other departments. Great. As we circulate the so, invitation. Great. Uh, so let me start by perhaps um bring you out from your comfort zone because Erika didn't say something about me perhaps you will guess it by yourself então boa noite a todos eu chamo-me Silvia Melo Pfeiffer uh, sou portuguesa trabalho na Alemanha mas uh, e a minha primeira língua foi o francês apaixonei-me por línguas quando comecei a aprender francês e uh, quando já tinha mais de 30 anos, comecei a aprender alemão para integrar a universidade em Hamburgo, na Alemanha. So, I hope you are all a very, a feeling very like boom, uh, out of your linguistic comfort zone and thinking, what the hell was this? So, um, by the way, this is how I started my appointment, my interview in Germany, because I couldn't speak German properly. So I told them, well, I can speak other languages. So let me give it a try. And I got the job. So um, <laughs> if you try the same strategy, then just report back on me. I'm very curious <laughs> about this. Um, so, and I'm going to talk to you, uh, to talk to you about... Um, Oh, Enrica, you have to give me the, the permission. Oh, yes, the permission, sorry. Thank yeah. you. Um, I'm going to talk about um, research methods in applied language studies that also sometimes provoke some kind of discomfort. Um, and I've been noticing it because uh, sometimes when I'm trying to publish on these issues, there are some preoccupations that um, some worries that it might not be scientific enough. What does it mean uh, to, to, to use arts-based approaches um, in research uh, more broadly and on plurilingualism uh, more specifically? 
So what the, the kind of reasoning that I'm going to present today is also the kind of reasoning I always try to put on my papers so that they get accepted. So if you have some kind of troubles using these arts-based approaches in your research, you, you will probably recognize um, your arguments and you probably will want to use some of these arguments to, to support your research and to, to, to challenge what research is and what research is all about and how it is made. Um, I will focus on just on two of the art-based approaches um, in, in research about multilingualism, um, drawings and poetry. And um, I will focus on the work that I've been doing with um, uh, student teachers, German student teachers that are going to teach Spanish and French as foreign languages. So um, today I will discuss the potential of adopting these this arts-based approaches in research on plurilingualism. And I will present some studies that I, I could all publish about and using these research methods. And then we can reflect together upon the added value of using arts-based approaches in research. Um, as I told you, I will draw my, my reflections on drawings that I will be calling visual narratives because we, we already know about narratives, textual narratives, written narratives, and they are accepted as uh, research methods. So when I call it visual narratives, it's more acceptable than just calling them drawings. Uh, there's some kind of misconceptions about what we call to, this, um, to these methods. Um, I will use plurilingual poetry, and I will be talking about plurilingualism, and, but, but you already know this distinction being with Erika for so many, so many times. So this distinction, plurilingualism, multilingualism, I adopt plurilingualism to speak about the students' repertoires, the, the student teachers' repertoires, instead of multilingualism that I will um, uh, use just to, to, to describe multilingualism, for example, in Hamburg or the coexistence of languages in, that, in, in Germany, for example. And because I'm dealing with um, drawings that make use not just of language, but also of other semiotic resources, and you will see a lot of them, I will be speaking about multimodal translanguaging. So the ways the student teachers combine drawings and words and symbols um, to, um, to convey meaning um, about how they become multi plurilingual and how they become, uh, became a French or a Spanish teacher. So let me start with, um, what I call oh, João Santos is, 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 it must be Portuguese <laughs> or Brazilian. <laughs> so um, let me just show you what I'm talking about when I talk about arts-based approaches to teacher language education. These are some of the, of the elements, some of the aspects I've been working with and eliciting my student teachers to do. And for example, you can see on your left a linguistic biography uh, with different elements. You can see what I've called a drawing or a visual narrative for, from a path from being born in 1999 until making the path to the university in 2015. You can see some more PowerPoint um, narratives with, um, with the elements that you usually see in PowerPoint illustrations. And then as well, I, I ask my students to draw the perfect Spanish and French teacher. I think you might identify the French and the Spanish teachers because they are visually very different um, of each other. So you will see the Barry Basque for French and you will see uh, uh, a teacher with I love Spanish, España in the t-shirt. So they are represented visually. And I also um, asked them about 
who do you think will be your French or Spanish students? So to let, to, to let them envision their future classroom. And you see by the four drawings just in the, in the, uh, in, in the well, how do you say, the above and the, um, in the bottom of the, of the slide, you see that some students are motivated, some students are not, and um, you can see that they picture their uh, future audience uh, very differently. So when I speak about arts-based approaches in teacher language education, I speak about linguistic biographies, I speak of professional biographies, digital storytelling, college, poetry, and so on. So all this kind of visual, multimodal um, voices that students use to express themselves. So um, as initial assumptions, why these um, visual, these arts-based approaches are so important nowadays is that we have been used, we have been um, using um, methods to research multilingualism and to research plurilingualism as well that are based in, uh, in discourse, uh, interviews, questionnaires, written narratives, just to name a, a, few, um, a few of them, what, what Bloch called um, the empire of the written discourse, the, the empire of lingualism. And so questions uh, as, how do we learn languages across the lifespan? How different are the professional paths of multilingual and of plurilingual and monolingual teachers? So all these questions have been addressed from this um, empire of uh, the written discourse perspective. And we have not yet been using uh, arts embodiment and multimodality to research such uh, such questions. Um, there are some performance studies, some theater, but they are really quite rare in the in nowadays. So um, as Miriam and Tisdale already said in 2016, okay, we are used, we are used to use uh, research methods and to analyze data that are words, but people do not make meaning or express it only through words. And that's when we see that other methods of meaning making would be interesting. If you work with, um, uh, with newly arrived refugees in your country, for example, as I've been doing with families um, or with kids that, that don't have or still don't have the, mini, the, the, the means to express themselves in the same languages uh, as the researcher, for example. If you don't want to use translators or uh, linguistic mediators, you can use other forms of meaning making. So giving them a voice behind the language that they don't know yet because they are in the process of becoming bilingual or plurilingual. So why not give them other means to express themselves? And the results are really gorgeous, I have to say. It's something empowering people that may have some difficulties also in producing speech. Why not? There are so many possibilities. So um, Miriam and Tisdale say, we can use other forms of collecting data and analyzing data through, for example, theater, photography, music, dance, story, and poetry. And so we can enlarge the ways we see research and data collection. <coughs> and more recently, Barono and Eisner also um, told us that um, arts-based research um, is an effort to extend beyond the limiting constraints of discursive communication in order to express meanings that otherwise would be ineffable. So we couldn't really um, discover an approach that challenges the standardization of research methodologies and promotes methodological pluralism. I don't know how it is with you, but sometimes I really get bored seeing always the same studies being made with the same methodologies. And um, 
I don't know, um, you probably know this guy who wrote the, 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 uh, about the scientific revolutions. I just forgot the name. It, it will come, come back again. And he says that in order to come up with new ideas, with new methodologies, with new ways of meaning making, we also have to come up with new ways of seeing research and seeing data collection and what, it, what counts as an evidence in our, um, in our research practices. So we have to sometimes defy the research habitus, if you want to use this word from Bourdieu, and try something new. Just have the guts to innovate if you want to come up with new ideas and make sense otherwise, to think otherwise. Um, so the concept of arts-based approach may be considered, and this is a big word perhaps, disruptive. Disruptive because it calls for an expansion of what counts as data and as an evidence in our, in our research field. Um, it has the potential, I, I, I truly believe in this, um, it has the potential of producing innovative approaches in the research field and bringing perhaps new hypotheses, new insights uh, to what we have been doing and perhaps to include new people in our research because these methods are more inclusive in, because they are not just focused on language. Um, but and this is important, um, it doesn't, those methods um, do not completely overlook the role of language in the production of knowledge and in the production of science, but it, it considers science, it considers data collection more holistically through this combination with other modes. It's not a coincidence that um, we see so many studies nowadays on, uh, on, for instance, linguistic landscapes on using photographs to research um, the presence of the languages around us and other semiotic resources, of course. But we see a boom, for example, in the use of linguistic landscapes, also in education. So. Um, it all together, I see they, they, they probably um, stress the importance of giving visuals and giving other senses also a place in research. I have been reading a lot on sensecaping as well and making sense of, for example, how people use um, words in their clothing uh, to, to create identity and to sell one kind of identity or the kind of words and languages they tattoo in their skins, what is called sin, sin, skinscapes. So there's a lot of new research going on uh, through a more uh, flexible, holistic view of language and how we produce languages and how we communicate with others with languages, but also with the, how, we, how we use our clothes and uh, the way we tattoo ourselves. So I don't have any tattoos, by the way. Um, but just to give you an idea that there are, that's really very interesting research about this. Um, so when using arts-based approaches, um, we, um, we promote three uh, ways of thinking, if you want. One, we acknowledge the connection between emotion and cognition. Um, and um, David Block spoke in the, in the previous section on the, in, on the empire of the, of the language. I think we have been attached to this empire of cognition everything has to make sense. And I don't know how it is with your researchers, but I think there's a lot of no sense. There's a lot of things that we cannot explain in very rigid ways. So that calls for complex, for more dynamic and even unfinished ways of seeing research, uh, as seeing our contribution. Um, Art-based approaches also favor 
um, other means of expression. So as I told you before, we can include uh, and benefit audiences who may, and for different reasons, um, experience difficulties in verbal expression through this multimodal voice. And I think this is very important when working, for example, with children, or uh, as I told you, with po school populations or families that are becoming emergent bilinguals or plurilinguals in acquiring the language of, of the school, for example. And we also recognize while using these arts-based approaches, uh, we recognize the value of involving the subjects in meaning creation mm -hmm. and in using all the semiotic resources they have to inform us, but also to make them know themselves. Because as you will see in, with the examples that I'm about to present, working with these art-based approaches tell the researcher so much about the informants as the informants also tell about themselves to themselves. So it's a way of knowing yourself in a Socratian way. It's a way to exploit emotions and states uh, and feelings. And um, you will see that um, this is very visible um, in, some, in some of the data. So um, I told you that I was uh, focused on um, teacher education, language teacher education, professional development, and now the time has come to present the studies that I promised. None of this study uh, is what I've sent you previously, even if you will acknowledge some commonalities um, between studies. So both studies, um, you, may, you may guess, are with my student teachers, um, not because um, they are easier to catch up in my seminars or in my, in, my, in my lessons, but because I wanted to know how um, student teachers that or student teachers that were born or not born in Germany engage in this professional journey of becoming um, a teacher of a foreign language. And you should probably know that, or if you don't know, never mind, I will tell you. In Germany, English is the first foreign language learned in primary school. And then by the age of 12, you start a second foreign language and then a third foreign language two years later. So in order to get to university, to the university, you have to, um, to have uh, learned two foreign languages. And um, yes, in, and also German, of course. And you can even make the recognition of your competences in your own language so that this own language, the knowledge that you acquired at home um, can, can, be, can, can facilitate the entrance um, into the university. So it's, it's very plurilingual friendly if you think that even the languages that you acquired at home can help you in your path to, to the university. And 50% of my students for Spanish, they have a migrant background and um, they usually came from South America or Central America. Uh, so they, they, they call themselves natives of Spanish. And in the French classroom, I have about 30% of students with a migrant background, but they are much more diverse and they come from the Turkai, from Poland and um, well, Portugal. Uh, and it's, it's kind of more diverse in terms of linguistic So I called, I called the, the work with this, with this um, multimodal linguistic biographies um, a theoretical approach to analyzing my students. So we, we kind of created, it's, it, it looks like it can be misspelled, but not. It's a neologism that implies the connection of the combination of theory and an ethical concern to teacher education. It's a neologism um, that um, 
it's not just mine, with Alice Chick, my colleague in Sydney. We created to imply a positive, affirming, empowering, and celebratory attitude towards teachers' linguistic and cultural repertoires and experiences, uh, experiences that they may reinvest in future teaching practices. So we start by asking them, who are you linguistically? What are you doing here? What kind of teacher do you want to become? Um, and then we think, we try to make them transfer this, this um, knowledge of themselves to the wish of knowing their kids in the classroom. And so theoretical in this, in this, in this um, way of thinking about what I try to do as a teacher trainer, uh, or teacher educator I prefer, um, does merge theory and ethical concerns. So it's not just ethics, but we have a strong theoretical foundation as well, um, related to some teacher education principles. So um, we think that these multimodal linguistic biographies and arts-based approaches in general, um, they really are better suited to respond to the needs of linguistic education nowadays. Um, in Hamburg, for example, at the primary school, 50% of the kids have a migrant or have a refugee background in Hamburg. So it's kind of providing also the teachers with some, with some instruments that they can use in the classroom as well, if they, if they manage to do this transfer. And we, we try to prepare teachers to responsibly cope with linguistic and cultural diversity in this, in this world full of mobilities and, uh, and so many contacts, uh, transnational contacts. And we also, it, it, we, we also try to make, them, to make them understand that uh, being plurilingual is not uh, the exception anymore nowadays. It's an inescapable um, reality. It's, and we try to frame it even more positively. It's an inescapable resource in our classrooms, we, we, it, it would be full of us if we wouldn't work with these resources and, 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 and respond to this um, diversity. So this is what we, what we mean with theoretical approach um, to the use of arts-based approaches in education and in teacher education. So <coughs> we acknowledge that excuse me that teachers and student teachers as well okay they bring academic knowledge to my course they already know some principles of pedagogy of didactics general didactics not yet uh, foreign language um, they bring their own prior experiences prior linguistic experiences of learning of language at school and at university prior linguistic experiences of learning a language at home, even if they don't remember how the process occurred because it's more informal with the family and so on. Some visited some, um, some tuition, some courses in the heritage of languages, other not. And they also bring some professional funds of knowledge already because they have been all serving other language teachers their all life since they entered school and started learning English in the, with the age of eight. So it's not, it, it's not like the lawyer who enters the courtroom and is in the first time in the presence of all this apparatus. No, the, 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 the language teacher, the student language teacher has been, has, has, has been observing how teachers teach, and they are apprentice, apprenticeships of observation. So they already know a lot about the dynamics, even if they sometimes also develop false assumptions of what learning and teaching a foreign language is or should be, because they develop a lot of beliefs just by observing how the classes work. So, with this all in mind, this is the, the well, the schema I've been using to 
to, to come up with some uh, strange prompts uh, to give my students the opportunity to draw something. So in this case, I asked some, some students to draw their linguistic biography, just like that. So you might imagine the reaction if I would ask you, I don't know, uh, Maria or João, if I would ask you, draw your linguistic biography. Well, the first reaction is always, she's nuts. But we already know, knew about this when we uh, decided to take this course because, you know, students always talk about teachers. It's the way it is in professors. So they, they start thinking, well, why? why should I draw my, my, my linguistic biography? Can I write it down? So always this coming back to the linguistic empire, to this linguicism in education, they, 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 they quit, quit thinking of the school is, at, is waiting for us to produce anything else than just language. So they, they, they don't know anymore how they should draw their linguistic biographies, but they find the way out. And this is one example that I really love from a student teacher that was born in Venezuela. And you can see that she has a um, German background in Venezuela, Uma, Umi, Upi. These are words um, to refer to the grandparents in German, very emotional terms. It's the kind of words that kids use to talk about uh, grandma and grandfather, like Oma, Uma, Upi. And you see the Britzel, you see the Dindel, this typical um, uh, clothes in the Oktoberfest, you know, where people drink a lot of beer. So, and then you can see how she depicts different occasions for language learning, for lang learning English and French, and then Do German, excuse me, and then Portuguese, the last one, um, and the way she's now educating her own kids to be bilingual. So you see Naomi, Uriel, and Amadeo, the three kids portrayed as meine Kinder, my kids, in Deutsch, German, and Spanish. You see a lot of, I, I would almost say, um, monolingual, monoglossic imaginary. So you see languages attached, attached to countries, you see the flags, you see the, link, the, the symbol, the bread, the, the bread, bread cell, for example, that the Umi has in the hands in the, in the corner. Um, and you can see that countries are attached to languages. So student teachers tend to see and to consider um, the acquisition and use of their various languages. And I must say that in this particular group, the students had some three to six, or they recognize three, between three and six languages in their linguistic repertoires. Um, and they see this acquisition in a very linear chronological order attached to schools, to countries, and, <clears throat> and to, um, or to family, for example. In another one, <coughs> you can see the same a kind of representation. So the countries, the, the borders, the flags, the school buildings. Um, and you can see, okay, this is attached to an imaginary of what it means to learn a language and to use a language. And you can see that each language in the school curriculum, you see English, they started at the fifth grade, French at the seventh grade, and then uh, Spanish afterwards. Um, leading um, to uh, a stay abroad, abroad in Cadiz, so in, in the south of uh, Spain. So um, language learning for my students are represented at, as ve being very situated in specific spaces, uh, closed spaces, if you want. So if you see the school buildings, they are not att attractive at all, but um, they, they, they are connected to these linguistic moments of ecological transition. They 
go from one school building to another school building, this, is, this usually means that they are starting a new language. Um, and um, the, the participants seems, uh, also seem to suggest that there is only one language for one country, Pluricentric languages are represented, if it's Spanish, with the Spanish flag, if it's Portuguese, with the Portu Portu European Portuguese flag, if it's France, uh, French, it's the French uh, flag. So you don't represent the pluricentricity of the languages in your drawings. It's really, it, it brings you to the point, to the, to the, it makes you look at the linguistic ideologies, if you want, as if it was a particular lens, um, because they just draw the essential things for them. And three instances of language learning are giving much attention in both groups, French and Spanish teachers, the family, the institutional settings, and also living abroad. That's this myth, myth, um, mythology that if you are learning abroad, you are learning more and better and more rapidly. And I always say, I don't know, something is wrong with me because I'm living in Germany for so long <laughs> uh, with a, a German family, German kids. Uh, well, and I'm not progressing this fast in my, in my German uh, linguistic skills. What's wrong with me, Sylvia? So there's, there's a lot also of looking at these um, productions and trying to understand ourselves. And what I wanted to tell you as well is that when we choose our research focus, our themes, our data collection instruments, they are as much about our participants as about ourselves and our preferences. And so that's a lot of our own subjectivity when doing this kind of research. And it, it doesn't mean that it's not scientific. All research is, uh, has a lot of subjectivity, but how you frame it is kind of different. So in another study, I asked my students to draw themselves um, in the French classroom before and after an internship that they made at the school. And I have uh, 36 drawings before and after the internship. And I wanted to focus this time in the professional funds of knowledge. Let me show you how they portray the impact, the influence these internships have on the way they perceive the, the, their audience. So in this one, oh, ow, I'm advancing too fast. So in this one, you can see on your left that the student don't have a face. So it's like being an anonymous person. Um, in the blackboard, you can see grammar. You can see, okay, if it is singular with an E, singular plural. If you know a little bit of French, you will recognize this, 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 this kind of schema because it's the way you explain feminine and plural forms in the French classroom. She's saying something and she doesn't seem to give a lot of care or it doesn't meet a lot, blah, 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 blah. And she's in front of the blackboard alone without a face. After the internship, you can see a lot of very diverse students using different materials to learn. You will see some, uh, some use the dictionary. There are posters in the classroom. Uh, they, are, um, they have mobile phones uh, and they are, some are very um, motivated. They communicate together. It seems to be much more collaborative. So uh, she learned to see the diversity of learning styles, the diversity of materials around the classroom, and also to understand that contrary to the first drawing, a uh, classroom is not one man show. It's something that depends on the participation of this very different, very diverse audience. Um, so we can see here, some traces of professional development through the use of visual narratives without asking them directly. So uh, I was about to say the name. What did you learn during this semester in your internship? What uh, have you learned something about methodologies or whatever? So we don't ask them what we want to hear 
we let them express what they have learned, what they give meaning to without directly asking. So um, we avoid some kind of um, this interference of, okay, Sylvia is now expecting me to tell something about how great I think um, plurilingual, multilingual pedagogies are. So we avoid this kind of bias. They draw what they feel. Another one um, is this. You can see one, a very, oh my God, Maru, how do you say this? Well, very monochromatic. <laughs> Brown, <laughs> brown, yeah. Brown, very brown. thank you, Enrique. So something very brown, monochromatic, and the other one is full of color, much more col colorful. Again, we don't see the teacher. In the first drawing, we see um, a, a, this is a teacher with an obsession with colors, I, I can see. She's teaching the colors in the first drawing, le pantalon est vert, and she's still learning, teaching the colors in the second one, les couleurs marron, bleu, rouge, vert, marron. So the content is the same, but the way she reproduces, she, she imagines the, uh, herself in front of the class is much more diverse. So you can see all the students, some are bigger, some are smaller, some are blonde, some are, are, have dark hair, some are have short hair, long hair, as a method, for as a proxy to explain how she now sees um, the diversity in the classroom. And she's not alone any, uh, anymore. Um, and in the first drawing, she writes, um, Je suis nerveuse, un peu inquiète, uh, that it's been nervous, um, feeling nervous. And in the other one, she uses words like Spaß haben, we are having fun. Um, we have a very good uh, relationship. Um, we uh, use creative uh, methodologies. So she learned a lot, even if she stays with the French flag, okay, nous aimons le français, but it's much more dynamic in terms of colors, drawing the, the environment and not being alone in front of the class. And another one, you, you can immediately see that this guy is the same because it's almost the same teacher in the same place, same smiley face. Uh, but if you take a look of how he thought uh, vocabulary was taught in the first image, you can see a car and uh, visually represented and then the term in French, la voiture. And in the second one, you have on avion, and you have is, is teaching the, the transportations again. So it, it seems that students have some kind of obsession with, with, with a topic and they developed it further. So he, he learned um, also to, to use the previous linguistic knowledge using English as well. Um, he can use other, um, other resources in the classroom, as you can see. He's not alone in front of the class anymore. And while you here, you had kind of representation of a monolingual habitus in the classroom. In the second one, you can see that the classroom is at least bilingual. So there's this, it's kind of very specific, but these are clearly signs that something was changed and we can grasp it not by asking and make them think she wants to know about one specific um, topic because this is Sylvia. No, they are drawing openly what came into their minds when they see themselves in front of the class and how they have changed in time. <clears throat> And, oh my God, I think I've already spoken too much. So this is what I've been learning uh, with, um, with drawings and these visual narratives, making them reflect about their lived experiences of becoming, being a teacher, becoming and being a plurilingual subject. And uh, what we could also is, uh, say is that these are identity texts that reflect, um, that reflect 
who they are in a certain point. So it connects quite good with work being done in, in Canada as well by Gail Prasad or uh, Jim Cummins also used this identity text. So it connects to this kind of work on visuals. Um, and now, very quickly, Erika, how, 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 how many time do I have? Oh, you can take uh, 10 more minutes would be enough. Great, great. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, what I bring uh, in the second part of this empirical part is the plurilingual poetry. And it also started when, um, this is a secret, please don't tell anybody, but I was really bored with what the students were doing in the, in the classroom as a textual production. Uh, they should, um, I, I don't remember anymore, it was 2015, but it was really quite boring, even for me. So I told them, let's break up here and let's, let's try something different. Let's write a poem on the theme, Vivre Ensemble, uh, to live together and use all the languages that you know, all the languages in your plurilingual repertoire to come up with something uh, that expresses how you see vivre ensemble. So they started producing this very beautiful poetry. Mi casa es su casa, entra, pasa, pasa. Bienvenue dans la famille, tu es maintenant notre fille. Fühl dich wohl und leb dich aus, das ist jetzt auch dein Zuhause. And come, um, stay as long as you wish and come back whenever you want. Te avista y arrivederci. They always include a little bit of Portuguese to make, them, to make me happy. So, te avista and arrivederci, blah, blah, blah. And then they were just marveled with themselves. I never thought I could write poetry. It's so beautiful. Uh, I have never combined languages this way. So they are also stuck in this idea that the school wants them to produce language, discourse, and in just one language at a time. So they could see that, oh, we can combine languages and it's beautiful. It's freedom, it's borderless. So this is, kind of my first experience with poetry and uh, again from from this from this uh 2015 experience and um started reading on the power of poetry to express themselves i i also write poetry myself but um i was i was exploiting the potential of using poetry to speak about feelings and also we, we discussed some, some songs by Manu Chao and we acknowledge how full of poetry all these expressions are. Uh, even Madonna has bilingual songs at least. So we were like, oh, let's try to do something uh, similar. Let's try to, to use poetry as an alternative to the traditional narratives of doing inquire, of producing um, texts of making meaning of who we are. And in this current study, it's really very recent. So I've never published about this. You, might, you, you, you are my first audience um, and reading this, this production. So um, they were collected in this winter semester with my French and Spanish teachers, my, my, my I, I love this to call them victims because the same, they, they give me knowledge and they gain a lot of giving me knowledge because we discuss all these po poems together. And I told them again, living together as a prompt, um, using all the languages on their repertoires, but also reflecting on the poem, commenting the poem of some of their colleagues and then saying if this kind of tasks could be used in French or Spanish in the French or Spanish classroom as well. And they could reflect because as I told you, they have a lot of backgrounds. They could present their reflections in German, French and Spanish. So they were also free to, uh, to present their reflections in, the lang in these languages. Um, and 
This time I bring you some examples. I'm not reading all of them because you already saw the kind of combinations they make. Four languages are almost always present, German, English, French, and Spanish. In this case, also a little bit of Polish, if I'm not wrong. Oh my God, um, I forgot it. Um, but she reflects about uh, how difficult it is to move from a monolingual to a plurilingual mind, to a plurilingual mindset. So she says, it took me much longer to write a poem, poem than uh, I thought at the beginning. So I started sorting out the languages in my mind. And until I had this sorted out, I couldn't start. And I was always thinking, <laughs> It's very interesting of several languages directly when I wanted to think of a rhyme. So this is also a common misconception that poetry has to rhyme, but it's the way they see it. And uh, when reflecting about how can we use this kind of tasks in the linguist in the language classroom, the, she she says, well, it makes students aware of differences and similarities in the syntax, vocabulary, and the sound in different languages. And it, be, it, it, it became apparent. And it's so easy to see when you try to combine languages in such a way. Another student, um, this is very interesting. He adds Wolof to the creation. Uh, it is a student with a Senegalese background. And he says, I have used four languages, as you can see, these three languages, namely, uh, namely, namely, that's German. French, English, and German are easily recognizable. While the fourth, Wolof, is part of the Niger Congo language, and you maybe you don't even recognize it. So he even uses quotation marks to make it look even more different. So the other languages are acknowledgeable. You don't need quotation marks, but Wolof, I want to sign it as, it as different from the others. It was quite easy to compose a poem like that because the languages could compensate each other. Isn't this cognitive mediation and, and, and conceptual mediation? So we can see that languages can combine, compensate each other. Each language has a different potential and we can combine them, they compensate. So it's not that difficult guys, but this is someone growing up with several languages in, the, in this repertoire. And he didn't use all the languages he could. He thought, well, I could also have used Arabic, but it was too, dif too difficult to write down in my computer. So I didn't bother to put it in the poem. You can say, <coughs> this is a very conscious choice of which languages to combine. Other students did use Arabic in the poetry and it's, um, it was possible. I don't know, he didn't want to include it. Um, so we can also reflect on this plurilingual composition as um, a conscious way of giving voice and visibility to some languages, but not to others. It's, inclusion and exclusion. And we could uncover the meaning of this inclusion and exclusions. In another one, uh, this with, um, it's also very interesting um, because he stresses such monolingual and such um, monoglossic perspectives about languages. I have tried to be careful not to violate the grammatical rules of the individual languages. It's very common in this, in this student teacher's minds that languages have to be spoken perfectly and we shouldn't mix up and violate the rules. And they go further to say, I have only used the languages that I can speak fluently, the languages I know well. So a maximalist perspective of languages. And if they speak them well enough, they can use it for these poetries. Mm -hmm. And look, he knows, he knows much more languages or bits of languages as Blumahat would say. 
uh, in different languages. I could have included some phrases and words in other languages, such as grazie mille, bonjour, ni hao, smurbrud, but it felt more right to me to use only the languages. I know, so a kind of self-censorship in the languages it feels allowed to use. And it's very common also in plurilingual subjects that they feel they shouldn't use all the repertoires because people will ask them. They have kind of this imposter syndrome. If I speak some languages or introduce more, they will think that I know all these languages the same way. So it's very interesting. Uh, and in terms of the pedagogical value of using um, this, this kind of a task in the classroom, they, they, they say, well, they can write very colorful and varied poems in English, German, English, again, the languages that are in the curriculum and possibly other languages. Furthermore, the people think about the constellation in which they write their sentences or verses, so they will reflect upon uh, syntax, for example, or phonetics, and see that some languages have some sounds, some languages are of another one, other sounds. Here, again, the same conclusions. I can only speak these languages fluently, so this maximalist approach, we can see it's not systematically analyzed yet, but I saw these common trends emerging. Again, the idea that we have to speak fluently. If it's not fluently enough, so you don't use the languages, uh, perhaps to avoid some kind of uh, this syndrome, the imposter syndrome. He doesn't even use too much of the mother tongue, which is Hungarian, because it's not even an Indo-European Indo language. It's very difficult, so you won't understand it. So let's, uh, well, not give it that much uh, visibility. And it's interesting, but it might not fit all the students. So he thinks of pedagogical approaches. He, he clearly sees the, in, in which scenario this kind of activity can be used. And he says, I will try out in groups. So the students would have the possibility to combine even more languages and to negotiate the languages they want to put in the poem. And this promotes people's language awareness and motivation in line with the Veo language. So you can already see that they are using the language and the meta language that I have been working with in this seminar on plurilinguistic approaches. So they first think Sylvia is getting nuts again. She's proposing something uh, that we, we did never uh, do. A, in, in our previous lives. So the idea of writing a multilingual poem was pretty terrible, uh, but then they managed to do it. They, they can even uh, acknowledge that words in some languages are better suited to express some feelings that German or English that they no longer. Um, they think of this uh, plurilingual poetry as good mediums to make students aware, aware of different languages and to give everyone the opportunity to present their individual language skills. So it's um, a, a task that promotes equity in the way the students um, may display their linguistic repertoires. Um, and it's very good for intercomprehension, they say, because you are always comparing languages, seeing the similarities and the differences. Uh, it can be quickly established that some sounds have different orthographies in different languages. Even at this level of the correspondence between phoneme and grapheme, they see it as a potential for using this, um, this uh, methodology. And some sounds do not occur in other languages at all, and it makes it quite difficult to find out some rhymes in this plurilingual poetry. So it seems like um, using this plurilingual poetry may teachers reflect about their own plurilingualism. They say, I can speak those languages. I cannot speak them that well. Um, uh, or I can just understand some words. I just dispose of some bit of languages. So they reflect about their own plurilingualism. They also reflect about the plurilingualism of their students. 
their future students saying it is a very interesting strategy to include the languages of the pupils in the classroom to make them be and feel creative and also um, they start thinking of how could a, how could I include this kind of um, task in my classroom what could I do so they start envision ways of doing classroom talk that it's not monolingual that uh, does not abide by the monolingual habitus that Ingrid Gogolin described. So just a small synthesis. Uh, we know that plurilingual um, approaches, plurilingual methodologies is as kind of ways of fostering the attention the students may pay to plurilingualism around them. It promotes empathy towards their own plurilingualism and the plurilingualism of the other. And they start also uh, developing some curiosity towards what kind of students will be my students. And they start doing some research, even in, the, in, the, in their uh, classrooms, on what kind of linguistic, sociolinguistic profiles have the students. And they make um, some research on their scenario. So this is a kind of plurilingual lens to look into the classroom from the very beginning and not just when they discover that, oh, the pupils are plurilingual, what a surprise. So they start uh, moving towards a more plurilingual um, mindset. And um, so through these tasks, through um, art-based approaches, we allow subjectivity, emotion, and the self-expression to emerge. They really engage, they really invest emotionally in task completion because it's about them first, and then it will be about their student population. About reflexing, uh, ref, uh, reflecting and creating empathy towards being them becoming plurilingual and identifying with people that are plurilingual, challenge the monolingual bias and construct uh, construct pedagogy, pedagogies that are not that respectful of boundaries, not that respectful of what is logic or logical or what is expected from them, but that, that enacts them to respond properly to linguistic diversity. And these are some of the references that I've used for this talk. And I have to finish in Portuguese, so muito obrigada. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Melo Pfeiffer, for, for, for this very, very interesting talk. Um, yeah, thank you. And you may stop. Uh, sharing your screen so that we can thank you uh, for your patience <laughs> see. no 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 it was we i forgot when i presented uh, savia to remind us of the many languages that she has uh, she is able to speak but also the her her own biography uh, moving from one country to another and juggling different cultures and languages on an everyday basis, which is not- It was easy. not planned, Erika, it just happened. No, it has usually it things in life, but, uh, but then that stays and that shapes our identity as well. No? And, and then the passion to, to connect that to the work and the other student, the student, the, the student teacher that, that you work every day with. Okay, so we saw a very interesting and very innovative research methodology uh, presented now, presented in the articles and reflected upon. Uh, we have some time to exchange, ask questions, make a comment. So I let you start this is our time so Rebecca has the first uh, question or comment please go ahead um, my question is uh, related to if any of your studies have looked at um, like the if this multimodal approach to language um, 
I guess, increases the effectiveness of foreign language acquisition, or if it's more about just self-reflection and understanding their place uh, in a, I guess, a plural linguistic classroom or a, yeah. or a society. Thank you, Rebecca. This is a very interesting question. And unfortunately, perhaps uh, my answer will be no, I didn't use it to, to analyze the influence of these methods on language acquisition, no. Um, what I tried was always to um, raise awareness of plurilingualism as something that we live by, that we experience ourselves, and it's um, that is something our, our colleagues and our students are experiencing, experiencing themselves as well in, in sometimes very monolingual um, contexts or in contexts that are strongly marked by, by a strong uh, monolingual mindset that creates the impression that other languages are not even allowed. So it's about, it's more, uh, it's more about raising awareness of our own identity and the way um, we live our languages and we live with our languages and through our languages. And sometimes uh, you should, uh, I don't know, I don't know Enrique how it is with you, but every time I have the opportunity and sometimes I do it with my students, I, I make them um, experience a crash course on Portuguese just to make them... Yeah remember how it is to be placed in a classroom and don't understanding anything or just very little. And I tell, I tell them just, this is the kind of experiences that some of your students will be living when they come to Germany. This is the kind of situation that you will probably leave if you move abroad and move to another country. And you are adults. I was an adult when I started learning German, when I moved to Germany, and it was very difficult to learn this language. 